Hey, welcome to the Evolution Security Podcast. It has been a crazy couple weeks in in the world, um, in my life, and things like I've had a lot of classes going on. Eric, we'll we'll talk about that. Been a lot of fun. It, it, it is fun being able to pass on information to people to be honored to have people come to my classes and the classes that training ground puts on shout out to Matt Reina. Now, Eric, how you doing, man? I'm sorry. I'm just blabbing on a little bit. No, nah, man. I, I, I feel like you, of course, we know some of the events in the last couple of weeks has really enlightened us to the state of the world state of society, the thought process on a lot of people, it's quite alarming to be honest. And we can hit on that a little bit when we go into some matter of factness later in, in the show that man, you know, I've been on the road a bunch too, man. I'm obviously in my home studio. Go ahead. You were away. You were kind of on assignment for a few weeks there, weren't you? Yeah. And of course, before that I've been on and off the road a lot this year. So luckily a lot of that's going to slow down for me. Well, um, bro, a- speaking this. of the road, I am looking forward to, we're putting the finishing touches on the plans, but I'm going to jump in my little Subaru BRZ and go on, on, go on a road trip to go hang out and train with you here in a few weeks oh, yeah. for our birthday. That's right, man. Can't can't think of a better way to spend my birthday, man, or our birthday, I should say. <laughs> the the stars the stars have aligned to where it looks like we're gonna get to spend at least most of that birthday weekend um together. Which Eric, remember it was a couple ECQCs ago, or maybe it was the last one that Josh went to. It was the first time we had been together on our birthday in probably 20 years. And Aaron, I actually think it was the one before that. Okay. Because I think my son, it was the one that my son was in, right? Okay. Am I wrong on that? No, I, right. you may be right, Aaron. Um, hmm. Something to think we, we've, about. Um, uh, we've had enough of those ECQCs up there in Washington. It is some of the, the um, details kind of run together. Yeah, we've had a lot of them. All I can say is when you're having that much fun, it kind of does, um, you know, when, when it does kind of run together, the details. But, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Well, Absolutely. May, we always say we might do a show when we're together, and then we just start having too much fun and don't feel like breaking out recording equipment. Yeah, maybe we can still do something. Um, yeah. figure out i think the biggest challenge for us is to do the the video right where it doesn't look dumb <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll see you bring bring your computer if you can just in case because i might be able to make something work here in in this area but if not man we'll we'll, we'll figure something out sure well hey eric just for some fun i wanted to you know this is our one of our gear and mindset episodes and I've got some gear now. This is not gun gear, but this is gear that's going to push me to do more music to send your way so we can record some new original music for the show. It's about time. Well, bro, we are we are in a crazy time with technology. I, I mean, everybody knows that. But with AI technology now or, or software, I still don't don't understand what that where that's going to take us. But Aaron, that, I don't mean to cut you off, but for a split second, that's what this new Jack Carr book is deeply about is AI, Red Sky Morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about that too, but hey, yeah. I, I do not want to go off on th- this is an important aspect, bro. This is an aside and then I'll get back to my piece of gear here. I've got a really good friend that is in I mean, a uh, freaking amazingly smart individual that makes his living with audio. He's an audio engineer. And he told me that AI is going to make 
his job nearly obsolete. Really? And what he's saying is there's a new field emerging where experts will analyze videos and audio to see if it's counterfeit. Mm. So it's going to be like a new forensic science and it's going to take experts to do that. And I mean, just think about how many things politically, you know, you could get some video of someone saying something really, really yep. bad, get oh, themselves yeah. in trouble. And you got two scenarios. It could be completely fake, right? And then someone like um, this gentleman would have the expertise to, to actually it'd be, be to a point where they would have to, at, at some point, um, give expert testimony in court. Yep. Right. But so it's, it's either really fake or the other politician, the politician is going to say it's, it's quote deep fake or something. Yep. Oh yeah. And that's all we'll start hearing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. AI but, and especially this book, which I won't go too deep into. I might talk a little bit about some of the aspects of the book. But I've, I think I've talked about this before, and it may sound silly to some of our audience, but I think a lot of folks that do think logically and think deeper is that, and I, I feel silly saying it that way, and then I'm going to mention a movie, but I believe that Terminator was a cautionary tale as in the same realm as Orwell's 1984 was a cautionary tale. Hmm. And it, it again, some people may find referencing a movie silly, but I think it has relevance. I get concerned about AI. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. In this book, Jack Carr's new book, his seventh book, is absolutely got me thinking about AI um, big time. And I, I wonder where we're going to head with it. it. It does have, I think AI technology has some outstanding aspects i think it i think it ultimately has more scarier attributes than i believe helpful I, that's just my initial thought well but bro i and i saw i was just watching a you know some some pro probably a ben stoger video or something and dude there was this weird this thing where Scarlett Johansson and Oprah were selling some product product for male sex enhancement. Hmm. Dude, those women wouldn't sell that stuff. It had to have been some fake image, um, you know, where they copped their image somehow. AI. It was some crazy. I was like, these women wouldn't be talking like this. Interesting. So, I mean, unless they really were, I, I'd say shame on them for saying some of the stuff they were saying, being who they are. But um, I, I did not intend to talk about this. Oh, so, uh, so back to some cool AI stuff. Okay, Eric. So, this is if you can see this. This is a small guitar pedal, and. Yeah. What it does is this actually is just the hardware to run some software that is called Tonex. And what it does is it models particular amps. I mean, it models anything you can put um, a signal through, basically. And so, look, Aaron, uh, Eric, sorry, I'm calling you Aaron. <laughs> so back there... You can see that black amp back over there. It says Carol Ann on it, dude. Which which was a one hundred percent custom made for me amp we got from a guy named Alan Phillips. I mean, it's a ridiculous fire breathing rock amp. And then that little red combo amp there, that Doctor Z. So you can see right now this this little thing has red lights on it, right? These these controls. And then when I switch it here. It goes gray, which is really just no light. But dude, that's those two amps loaded up into this little um, little 
so- hardware device. So you modeled those live amps into yeah. this software. Okay. Yeah. So, so how it works and you can do it using a microphone <laughs> to capture an entire amp rig. But what I was so stoked about yesterday, it's real, it's real kind of sensitive how it all works. And um, because you're, you're using these real hot signals going in and out of your amp in and out of, um, an audio interface, but long story short, you're sending this, this signal set of signals through your amp. First, it starts out with these clicks and then it sends a bunch of sine waves through it. And then it sends a bunch of different levels of white noise. And then it just starts playing a bunch of pre-recorded guitar parts with different guitars and different, um, different styles of playing and everything. And that all lasts about four minutes. And w- once, once the computer records all that data and that, that recording, you then kick off some AI software that, an, that analyzes it. And like, for instance, um, I used, when I captured, actually I captured it today again, my Carol Ann, that high gain one, when you crank up the distortion, it needs a higher level of the AI software to analyze it, where it normally like basic type, it takes about 10 minutes, but I set it up and it was the highest level of AI and it took about 40 minutes. Mm. Dude, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous how good I, I played my first gig with it with with high quality in ear monitors um this weekend and I could not believe it. Um, Very shout cool. out to Carl Wren out there. I'm pre- I, pretty sure I saw him playing a Nord keyboard, which are when it comes to at least organ and piano, um, some legit sounds. Again, just because of of technology these days. When I saw Harry Connick Jr., he was playing organ B um, B five, I believe is. Um, I'm going to miss misspeak about what B, but an organ um, Nord that makes some really cool organ sounds. I am rambling on, but point uh, is, I don't think so. Point is, yeah, AI software that is has. I don't like playing without my amps, but a lot of gigs you have to go direct like this even better e- even more dude th- this makes recording a gazillion times better so you just you just plug it into the main pa is on, is what i'm assuming Aaron? Mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. go um simplified yes but so i i have my red doctor z i recorded it the actual amp and all speaker and all with my microphone but my Carol Ann, I captured just the the amp itself, and I and then I use different. Um, they're called IRs, which are called um, impulse responses, of a bunch of different speaker cabinets. Cool. And I, dude, I literally have probably three hundred different combinations of microphones and different speakers and everything. And then I just mate that with with my um, with the head only. So yeah, dude, it's just ridiculous. I've been having a blast messing with this, and I got my bet. I got my best captures the last couple of days. So I, I wanted to tell you about that. I told you I got some gear that was going to help us record some more music and get me yeah, excited I'm, about that. I'm ready to do it, man. I need to knock off my rust of recording tracks. Because I, I currently have my um, interface. I don't have to look back there right now. It's close to my drums. But I also don't have the the current mics that I normally would record with attached. So so I need to need to start getting that back in order. So whenever you do send me some tracks, it doesn't take me two days to get ready to record. Yeah. So I'll start. I'll get on that. Well, bro, here. So on to some shooting aspects and martial arts etc last weekend i taught a four-hour course in drawing from concealment so 
I have been doing some eight hour classes, Eric, and decided to cut those eight hour classes, at least my um, class that is our defensive pistol one, which is an eight hour course. I decided I would split that in half and have one class that was grip and stance and then one class that was drawing from concealment. And of course there's, there's other topics in there, but um, those are the main focuses. And, and last weekend was the drawing from concealment because that is actually the number one skill, right? Is to be able to get our pistols out from under concealment since we're and into a defense on a defensive reactionary basis because we're defending ourselves. We can't be offensive. So that's probably all in all the most important thing a civilian can, can um, focus on. Absolutely. Once you get that down, you get a solid presentation to first one or two, three shots on a target about five yards I mean, you, you've got a solid skill set, and then you start working on the the rest of everything, right? Yeah, which in my opinion, I'm just going to lay this out, I think is having a, the I'm, I'm just flat out, the Shiv Works number two position, mm-hmm. you know, adding to that. I, I would say that that's the, the next most important skill is being able to fire from that position both safely and effectively having that thumb, por- thumb pectoral index firing position, which, you know, we talk about this on the show that I didn't intend to go down this road, but I can say it real fast. I think you and I agree when you, when you teach or instruct folks on that method, man, it's amazing watching how intentional and safe that people reholster at that point. Right. Do you remember Mm -hmm. us? We were like, man, this is honestly a really valuable tool in teaching that aspect. And of course we, we really draw on teaching that high reference point, Mm -hmm. you know, as far as a trigger finger um, reference point high on the, as high as you can on the pistol or index point. So yeah. Yeah, awesome. I just thought I'd bring that up too, buddy. Go ahead. Well, so my wife and my 15-year-old son both came to that class, and both of them had a great time. And I'll tell you what, man, my son, Graham, it, it kind of makes me mad. A dude hardly ever shoots, <laughs> and he was kicking butt. And I mean, he was having such tight groups. I, I was walking by. I said, Graham, you're shooting too slow, buddy. If, if you got groups like that, man, we're, we're working practical shooting here. I want you to get a little bit wider groups so you're shooting faster. But yeah, I was proud of him. I was proud of Becky. And we had um, the other students there that, that, that really liked the class. And now... So on top of those classes, Eric, I'm going to offer those again here in the next couple months. And I've got some ladies only classes coming up, but I, I'm thinking about putting a basic home defense focused carbine class. Now, awesome. to make very clear, you know, we, we teach civilians, but it's very civilian focused you know, because we all know the ex-military, ex-police officer that, that becomes a firearms instructor. Man, they're great at at teaching, I know, but sometimes it doesn't translate well to civilians. I've taken some classes from from some of those gentlemen, and and they just taught people a bunch of stuff and didn't even explain at all what it applied to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've you been know, in some of those classes with you. <laughs> So I just, I want to make sure that, that my students come away knowing why I'm teaching what I'm teaching and, and make it fully applicable to the civilian or home defender in this case. So this would be a very basic carbine class, which would go over zero in your rifle, of course, and helping them understand trajectory and, and um, mechanical offset and all that stuff. And then setting up your rifle um, with a sling and a light 
and then of course making sure they have a, a good optic or sight system they have but what what i think is going to be fun is i'm going to do it after the time change and it's still going to be a four hour course it's so we're going to start it at 4 p.m. so we can shoot in the dark. Now, the reason why I want to do that, some may think that, you know, that's military type, um, you know, um, LE type. No, because I, I really want them to understand the concept of, of threat identification inside their home. And so show them light techniques and everything that, that will allow them to identify targets without pointing their AR by chance at their teenage son. Yep. And, and those are things that people don't think about until they have that real bump in the night and then unfortunately start pointing their weapon and even more tragically, maybe um, shooting a family member. We know that that's very real, but that's one of the main reasons why I want to, teach the darkness portion well one of the things that i'd like to bring up Aaron claude werner quite quite a long time ago well, i say quite a long time ago at least at least a few years ago and shout out to claude werner why we haven't had him on yet i can't understand why we got to make that happen but his blog the tactical professor has some excellent information on there and I recall him mentioning one time some dry fire drills that he recommends. And I thought, man, you know, again, when we base everything around having a mental map for something, mm -hmm. how crucial that is. And, and Aaron, I probably won't ar articulate it perfectly, but I can probably get real close to what he was espousing. And this was with a pistol. And I've done a dry drill or several times with my AR as well that mimicked this on my, for, for my own version, but essentially <clears throat> using a couple of different flashlight techniques. And I'm don't necessarily have to go over those right now, but essentially in using your light and your pistol handheld, not a, a weapons mounted light in this case, and a couple of, uh, of different shooting positions that you may prefer and would would verbalize, you know, hey, who's there? And then actually state to yourself, hey, dad, it's me. Okay. And then mm. you're doing this from a low ready, you know, identifying this um, unknown threat and or again, doing it again. Hey, who's there? You know, and, and illuminating this uh, possible threat. And it ends up being a threat. You've identified it. You've pos positively identified it as a threat. And then you take your dry fire shot. And just that, I know I'm, I'm going, you know, breezing over it. There's a lot more detail to it than that. But just for the sake of this discussion and what we're intending to get through tonight, I think it's well enough said that, hey, if you're not doing anything related to threat identification that you at least go through that process mm -hmm. when you're dry firing every now and then using a light in darkness and verbalization through it because you at least created a mental map may not be this perfect you know tactical SWAT team you know hostage rec hostage rescue mental map but you will at least have that as a mental map so Anyway, just thought I'd bring that up, buddy. Well, thank you. Well, and again, it's going to be very basic. It's it's not a tactical door kicking class, but I want to expose people that often may not have put a lot of work into setting up their rifles, and a lot of it considering some of these things that most people that are meaning well but don't don't get much training and w number one, don't think about a lot of these things because you're not going to think about this stuff unless you're exposed to it. Y you don't just naturally, I mean, I I'm sure, yes, naturally people think, okay, I don't want to shoot my teenage son or for instance, you know, think about the, the daughter's boyfriend that's climbing in the window, etc., or the drunk guy that, 
thinks his wife's not letting him in the house, although he's, you know, he lives next door to you, but kicks in your door in the middle of the night. You know, again, those, another person you don't want to want to shoot either. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm just going to make sure that a lot of that is covered. And again, because it's going to be a basic civilian home defense carving class. And I'm, I'm looking forward to putting that together. So, sounds like it's going to be a good one. Look forward to hearing about it. Well, bro, speaking of p- part of that class, right, will be rifle setup. And one of the most important aspects is, and I, and I agree too, that really a carbine needs a sling, a light, and then an optic. Agreed. So, so I'd like to talk about um, slings and just real quick slings and, and how you prefer to set yours up, what slings you're running, et cetera. Yeah, man. Um, so we kind of talked about this before, you know, cause I, I think we've covered slings on our gear and mindset show, but, um, right now this is, this is my main AR. It's a, it's a BCM, um, running a vortex, uh, razor on the top of it. And of course I've, I've got my light here. The sling that I'm running on this rifle is a good old Proctor sling. You know, and, and Brian, if Brian, you know, listens to the show a lot of time. He likes to give you and I a hard time about the the Proctor sling and the and the 550 cord that that um Frank Proctor went with on this sling. But this is just a basic sling. It's got a real good sliding system. And you know it's it's not very expensive. I think I think might have paid forty five like, bucks, yeah, max. You know, I think I remember paying just over like thirty five at the time. There, no doubt, in in this economy, they went up in price. But Aaron, I, I prefer to put my slings at the furthest point that I can get, either on a sling attachment, like right now I'm pointing at the end of my rail, and at the end of my stock here. I feel, and, and a two-point sling is what I prefer, and I think you would agree with that. But I like it at the farthest points because I feel I don't get wrapped up in the sling um, unnecessarily, and that's where I feel I I use my slings the best. Your, your thoughts on that, Aaron? And I'll well, bring up so, another sling. So th- this is my BCM SBR, and... I of course also have the on this one the the Frank Proctor. I, I don't. I every single one of my rifles has a has a Proctor sling. Now, I used to have mine all the way out at the end too, and I've been toying with closer here to the receiver. Okay. It's, let's see here. It's it's about um, two inches. Um, past the 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 upper receiver. The reason why I'm, I've really liked this is when I'm working on the range, it it stabilizes it a little better when I cinch it up. Yeah, yeah, that that absolutely is true. And a lot of the reason why we have a sling is to stabilize it if we're in a tussle in our house. Right. Um, so I, I just feel like it, it, it connects to me a little bit better than having it further out. But again, the, the, these are things that are personal preference mm-hmm. and th- this is actually a new way I've been running it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it like this. I talked to our buddy, Chris LaPre. shout out to him. He, he told me, man, I couldn't do it right there. Yeah. And you know, yeah. th- hey, I don't I don't do two or three weekly door kick-ins like him in Pinal County as a SWAT guy. But um another thing I think it has to do with if you've got a plate carry on or not. Um so you know, I mean there's just so many so many considerations. And to be frank, Aaron, I've never tried it that way. Um that type of sling. So I can't give you any input on that. I, I see all kinds of advantages for it. I, I see 
I see some aspects of it that I just prefer the other method. But again, we're talking about personal preference here and what folks are used to. What I would say is that both methods have thoughts behind them and they're useful, you Mm -hmm. know, and, and other folks out there, please, you know, if you want to comment on how you like to run your sling, we're always open to to hear what other folks have to say about it. Oh yeah. Uh, And, and to, to agree on that. Yeah. I have, I have my sling on the, on the end of my buttstock too. I've had it here and I've had a one point sling, you know, those are, those seem to be kind of super cool for tactical stuff and, and shooting, um, you know, changing shoulders, et cetera. It's yeah. real easy, but man, they sure sl- sling around and, and nut punch you. If you Yeah. And Aaron, I'm, I'm just going to say it the way I, I, I don't, I don't think changing shoulders has a lot of, a lot of meaning for me that that's just me. And I've got a few reasons why I believe it. Well, number one, I, I don't see well enough out of my left eye of keratoconus. But I've also talked to, you know, some much more relevant folks in that realm than than myself or ourselves. And um, I'll just I'll just lay it out. Uh, Matt Pronka, I talked to him about it because this subject came up during Interesting. A, this subject came up during a class that he and I attended together. And it was on room clearing. Great, great class. And, you know, of course, Matt had his thoughts that, you know, his methods, you know, and but he still attended the class. He was interested in it and and enjoyed it. But that subject came up and I at flat asked flat out asked him and I even preface I'm like, I don't do it, but I'm I'm wondering what your thoughts are. And he's like, hell no. He said he said you. I forget exactly what he said. I think he said something about, you know, does a does a um, NASCAR driver, professional NASCAR driver, change change seats when he's driving? Just to, you know, I forget exact. I may be totally hosing it up, you know, and and any type of Olympic level skill. When you develop one way that you shoot or one way that you do a highly developed skill, why would you move to the other side with something that you don't develop remotely close to that skill? So that's cool. That is cool to hear. I was wondering if you're talking about um, Matt when you, when you mentioned someone and he still does that for a living. Yep. As far as I know. So Eric, real quick. So, as we're talking about this, I'm kind of looking at um, my um, Hollow Sun 510 on my Unity Fast Riser. I'll tell you what, man, going to a higher higher point for your red dot, it, it is awesome if you're shooting like I usually do, 50 yards and in. Um, it, when when you don't have to crank your neck as much. See, this is what made me look into getting a higher riser was I hadn't really shot much after I had my neck fixed. Mm-hmm. When I got my neck fixed and started going back to shooting carbine, I just felt like I had to crank my neck too much to get a cheek weld. And especially in a, when you're trying to get a quick acquisition. So ha- have you ever thought about going with, with or trying a um, higher rise um, mount? What I would tell you is, Aaron, I have not felt the need to. Mm-hmm. Um, so, no, I haven't put forth a whole lot of um, a lot of thought into it, Aaron. I will say this, shooting prone, uh, you know, and I'm just like you, man. We're getting older. And in the prone position, I know I don't like sitting there very long taking taking a lot of prone shots and really focusing on that because my neck starts hurting but in in normal positions Aaron you know this this is body type um th- this is can be a, a body type physiology type problem as well meaning that you know we're two different people mm-hmm. and and I just have not found it necessary I, I I and it could be the way that I've developed my index and my mounting for that mm-hmm. that I just haven't 
felt a need for it. I'm not poo-pooing it at all. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying I haven't I haven't found a need for it. Well, I'll have to I'll have to let you check this out. Um, maybe I'll bring this with me um, to North Carolina. But so anyone, I mean, just as an aside, check out the Unity Fast Risers. There's a there's one for a um, absolute co witness level, and then there's one for um, a one third. And um, I think the way I have this set up is this is one for the um, lower third, and it puts it puts my red dot sitting up at about um, two point one inches. So, and, and then there, if I was running a, a T1 or T2 aim point type, um, I would, th- there's a really cool one by Scalarworks called the Leap One. So, yeah, I've, if, I've seen that. Yep. Yeah, that, that one, I, I'm going to get one of those for my wife's rifle that's running a T1 on it. But, okay. That's well, enough well, about that. But, well, Aaron, before we go for Oh, forward, sorry. Yeah, yeah. You I, got I, I meant to, yeah, I was just going to bring up another sling that I use. I pulled this off of one of my other rifles. I've got a couple of these hanging around. But this is a Blue Force um, Vickers sling. And I, I dig this sling. This is another one of the, the, the slings that I have in my arsenal that, uh, that I enjoy. It's got um, quick QD mounts, and, and this resides on a couple. But I just wanted to bring this up as another option for folks out there that are interested in slings and maybe not may not have one. Those two slings are, I think, some some of the best choices, frankly, if, if we can say that. Yeah. Well, what you think, Aaron? You want to move on? Yeah. What you got? So I've been having a lot of thoughts about drones for quite a while. And frankly, you know, thinking about if there was ever, ever hard times, which, you know, who knows, man, we don't, we don't know where this world's leading right now, but I honestly think that I want to move down that direction and, and, and owning one or two drones myself for just baseline overwatch reconnaissance in your neighborhood, you know, I mean, getting up eyes in the air around your perimeter or your extended perimeter just is, is extremely valuable. And we know they're, they're used downrange. I mean, frankly, some of the examples aren't necessarily relevant to this, but man, anytime we got hit with indirect fire, you you heard the drones up in there, (laughs) predators up, up in the air and, you know, looking for the enemy and, and then also those drones go on standard patrols, you know, at at all hours of the day. Now, bro, to, to mm-hmm. be clear, are we talking about actual predator drones, or are we talking about even, um, you know, you know, something closer to what civilians? I'm sure it'd be different, but so, are so we right about now, two I'm, different types here. Well, right now, I'm just speaking. Yeah, I'm. I was that reference was actual predator drones, and those suckers are big. Yeah, you know, they're big and obviously out of out of the realm for civilians. But it is very it's becoming more and more common, you know, of course, in special operations, use drones. And I also which I'm going to hit on here in just a second is the U.S. U.S. military is actually looking for commercial off the shelf capabilities. So, I mean, I know that there's a few that they likely are, are checking out, but they're in the middle of, this is most recently making selections for those smaller commercial off the shelf, uh, systems or, or drones for like all the way down to like the squad level in an infantry platoon. So, but yeah, what you got? Because, and I was going to bring that up. I mean, you can spend, at least the last time I've been around any friends that have gotten pretty dang expensive drones and watching them fly them a handful of times and then all of a sudden just ooh, just drop out of the sky. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming the technology is better, right? But I mean, I'm talking about buddies that have freaking $2,000 drones that work for about 10 minutes, it seems. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. So, um, so it, I'm assuming there's some pretty good commercial level ones that, I mean, if the, if the military is looking at them, do you kind of have any examples, bro? Yes. Or? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Now, a lot of these, Aaron, again, some folks may poo poo on some of these because a lot of them are Chinese. Um, they, but they're attainable. Hollow oh, son. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is off of PC mag. And this is uh, the best drones for 2024. A high quality drone can add production value to a film project or help you get a unique view for your travel vlog, blah, blah, blah. I don't need to go into that. But of course, this is from a, a purely civilian standpoint, but a, a, just a few examples. So, and, and DGI, DJI, excuse me, is, is definitely a Chinese based company. But they they have a lot of the, so I'm seeing like the DJI Mini Four Pro, which is nine hundred and fifty nine bucks currently, and we're talking about this on what is this twenty eight July twenty twenty four. Best entry level drone is a DJI Mini Two SE, and it's two hundred and seventy nine dollars. You know, somebody's wanting to just get entry level and 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 you know start practicing, getting used to how they fly. And let me skip to probably one of the more popular ones that I keep reading about, Aaron. And full disclosure to the audience, I started this conversation on this show because I personally don't own one myself. So this is something I'm doing research on and talking with um, friends and also talking with folks that use them in, in the real world and asking them what they recommend. But I do believe that Rich uh, Brown of AWS has a Maverick 3. And mm -hmm. and Rich, if you're listening and I got that wrong, um, let me know. But this one currently is running around $2,200 $2, $2, on Amazon. So that's an expensive one, uh, or more expensive, I should say. <laughs> they get way more expensive than that when you get into some of these professional level drones. But Aaron, that, that kind of segues into kind of an interesting article. And Aaron, I found this on uh, Recoil Magazine online and it's titled Drones in the U, excuse me, Drones in the Ukraine, live from the front by Ian Harrison. And because I've been having, you know, I get, in and out of where's my pair of reading glasses all right because my eyes are a little bit wonky this evening so i won't read this paragraph well i'll, I'll just go and read it at recoil we review every product fairly and without bias making a purchase through one of our links may earn us a small commission and help support independent gun reviews let me skip here um, it's not a stretch to say that we're currently witnessing an inflection point in the history of warfare, cheap, disposable, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones are having, having as much of an impact on the aspect of the human condition as the advent of the machine gun in the early 20th century. And that's a, that's a interesting and well-taken statement. And no specialism be, excuse me, and no specialism, be it infantry, armor, artillery, or logistics has escaped their presence. Hmm. We can say that the U.S., with our military dominance in the battle space, will be less affected by this change. And if we head down that route, it's a mistake that we'll pay for in our lives, in life, excuse me. Since I started covering the war in Ukraine from, front, from the front lines, one thing that's been brought home in stark relief is the pace at which this area evolves, with both, both sides developing tactics, countermeasures, and technology at breakneck speed. Scrap used to make frag, of course. We have seen this many times before. Better armor on tanks necessitate bigger guns to defeat it. Bigger guns and thicker armor need more powerful engines to move them. 
Darwin in action. Here's what I'm seeing now. Back in mid-2022, the Ukrainians gained a tactical advantage through the widespread employment of ready available commercial off-the-shelf drones, which you know we kind of hit on already, such as the Chinese DJI, DJI Maverick 2 and 3, initially used for spot for artillery and provide overwatch for Russian assaults. It wasn't long before they became weaponized, armed with either VOG grenades or improvised free-fall bombs hmm. released from 3D-printed saddles. Huh. Seven inch rotor. Um, so I know what this is because I, I deleted pictures um so that I could uh you know condense this. So that's what this is. It's it's enunciating a picture. Both sides are supposed to be covered by a sales embargo imposed by DGI, DJI. Man, that's that's a tough, tough thing to say fast. And enforced by a no fly zone embedded in their software. But this is circumvented by reprogramming or spoofing the drone's GPS trip to make it believe that it's flying someplace else. Hmm. The DJI has since imposed sales restrictions in Europe to further frustrate Ukrainian efforts to, to acquire them. But so far as we know, no such condition exists in Russia. Ooh, Ruskies. The Maverick 3 continues to provide reconnaissance capabilities to both sides, but it's used as a excuse me, but its use as a weapon has largely been supplanted by first person view FPV drones as they are cheaper and more easily sourced locally, which, you know, to to make the point on that is those uh those Mavericks we just talked about, they aren't cheap. You know, so you probably don't want to use those as weapons, especially if you're driving those little drones into, you know, targets. <clears throat> Excuse me. So early in 2023, I saw the widespread Ukrainian use of FPVs armed with RPG-7 heat warheads, which proved to be effective in defeating armored vehicles, as they typically work in top attack mode where armor is thinnest. For a while, the Ukrainians had the upper hand, as these drones of many different flavors and types were made in a local workshops, or excuse me, in local workshops by commercial enterprises and the widespread civilian volunteer network, which supports the armed forces. Rather than use a dispersed approach to R&D and manufacture, Russia opted to choose one of one of two types, then place massive contracts with a limited number of defense companies. As a result, the numerical advantage enjoyed for a few months by Ukrainian forces disappeared. And so, Aaron, I don't think it's necessary for me to to go much further. He talks about how, you know, you can jam these and, and looking at the frequencies um they are typically operating at 2.4 gigahertz and or 5.8 gigahertz. So I, I won't, I'm not going to give, you know, if we do have any nefarious folks out there, I'm not going to give them any, any recommendations on how to, how to jam, you know, cause I could go into that, but I'm not going to do that, but it still would not be easy you would have to have some special technologies and signal generators to, to be able to do that. But um, that's still pretty high frequency. But so to, yeah, go ahead. to, to really put a fine point on it. So we're talking about the Ukrainians using basic civilian drones as part of their military assets. A absolutely. You know, using it for overwatch, using it for reconnaissance, you know, using it to detect patrols coming close to their position from the Russians and, and again, weaponizing them. I mean, let's face it, even in in a condition of without rule of law in the United States, if that was to ever happen, you know, obviously with a little bit of ingenuity, it can be it can be weaponized here. I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> of course not. I'm saying Seeing the possibilities. I'm, yeah, I mean, if. 
capabilities. If, if, if push comes to shove, man, that 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 might be something that could come into value in 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 possible horrible times. But to I guess circle, my I guess my cat just joined us. Hey, Judah. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, Aaron to to drive home the point that you know folks may look into, you know, getting a drone for that exact purpose. You know, I, I've talked about this several times. If you if we were in hard times, let's face it, you'd have to have a, a rotating shift of security. You know, you can't you can't just everybody go to sleep. You know, you can't you can't just hunker down and and sit in a home or, or what we would at that point like a safe house that's got a, a perimeter around it and just hope that your your perimeter engineering is going to keep folks out. I mean, you really need to know, you know, ahead of time if, if folks are approaching your position. And I think these civilian drones could come in handy during hard times, you know, just flat out. So I personally, I'm going to go down that road. I might go with something inexpensive at first just to, you know, get exposed to the technology, but I def definitely am going to make a decision on something of decent quality. And for anybody out there that wants to make some re recommendations, that's that that have been in this realm for for a time. Hey, crew at evosec.org, e email us your thoughts on that. Or you can interface with us on our social media because we'll be posting this show and and we'll probably have a little blurb about this discussion but yeah folks tell us tell us what you think out there especially if you got some expertise in this yeah i mean what do you think about it aaron is that something that sounds useful oh yeah definitely i just it's funny and and i'm sure it's my ignorance but that's what sticks out to me is my buddy spending a lot of money on a drone and I literally watched it just go up in the sky and then all of a sudden I mean literally just drop straight down and crash oh man yeah. you know I, if I recall correctly like I said I mean it seemed like it was about a $1,500 drone about seven eight years ago yeah so, and I, I would say that you know they, they have I'm not gonna speak at a line but I do know that some of the softwares try to negate that. Like, if for for instance, if if it loses connectivity to the controller, in some cases it'll it'll just sit there and hover until mm -hmm. you can recover. Yeah. Um. And and I know you know going further down the realm, Aaron. Eventually, some of these much higher cost drones can be programmed um, for autonomous behavior you know yeah. and not getting to so interestingly enough again you know i read a lot of a lot of books some of them fiction some non-fiction but a lot of these drone technologies at the military level can certainly be programmed for certain targets and just hovering over locations and man they see and have warheads on them you know, and, and can go in and buy that programming. They see a specific target that meets a certain criteria, go in on them. And I, I know that, um, Iran has, or excuse me, not Iran, pardon me. Um, Turkey has a bunch of drones that I've read about that do that. And I'm sure our, I'm sure our uh, military has some as well, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, close up on or close out i should say on drones by just reading a quick blurb here from defense blog u.s army shows interest in small cost effective drones the u.s army has issued a request through an official government contracting resource expressing interest in small and comparatively inexpensive unmanned aerial vehicles or uavs According to the request, the Program Executive Office or PEO Aviation Project Manager Uncrewed Aircraft Systems is seeking information on commercially available pro production-ready 
what's this say? A trip attributable, cost effective, and affordable small UAVs intended for use at the maneuver small unit level. The desired UAV system should feature a rapidly reconfigurable modular payload capability to facilitate mission changes across primary reconnaissance, surveillance, and target acquisition tasks with additional capabilities for target identification, communications relay, and kinetic missions. I know for a while, and I'll just speak off the cuff on this, some of the the communication systems that that I have personally worked with had originally talked about using or had theorized about using drones as radio relay, like little small satellites. Hmm. So wow, and, and you know that that's, that's kind of went the wayside, but it still could it could still end up happening. So cool, yeah, that's man. Interesting. So, I'm I'm gonna go down that road myself. Uh, I think it's gonna be useful for um, any various reasons, as, as I I stated before. So, Aaron, now I think um, we might go down what may be a little more serious of a topic. Um, you know, I'll just I'll just lay this out, Aaron. I didn't talk with you about this yet, but I what what I will say. And I know we, we spoke a little bit about a couple of these discussions, but Aaron, when, haven't you noticed how divisive the subject of even talking about the the uh, Trump assassination attempt has become? Have, oh, have yeah. you noticed that? Oh yeah. And this this like, I'm not necessarily speaking about this particularly, but man, did you also see that there's been all kinds of folks posting on social media about, you know, crying that the, the attempt didn't work. I mean, all over everywhere, you know, it's, it's crazy how people are, but I don't want to go too far down that road because our intent was just to kind of hit on some highlights because Aaron, you know, we, we're not expert at uh, close protection detail that, that, that uh, not even remotely in our, our wheelhouse. But to be frank, Aaron, I think I can speak a little bit on this subject just based on basic force protection that I've either been involved with directly in setting up or indirectly being under, you know, downrange, you know, in Afghanistan and, and Iraq and various other locations around around the world where force protection is important. And let's just face it, this attempt of assassination on president Trump, man, there was all sorts of failures all around, which we know it's all over everywhere where real experts have, have spoke on. And before I even go further in this, Aaron, one, one, one of the things or the intent of this discussion is to give folks some resources and where they can read some some factual information for themselves and or listen to. And so let me find where to write this down. Bear with me a second. Aaron. And as you're looking for that, we want to make clear. This stuff has been talked about ad nauseum. So we're, we're not trying to. We're just offering some thoughts on it ourselves. And we're not going to go into it too deep. But, you know it's too important of a topic and such a historic event that we can't just sit there and ignore it sit yeah. here and ignore it. So, and, and yeah, again, and t- talking about matter of factly, we're not going into politics or anything like that on it. So just want to make that clear. Um, if, if you're sticking around with us here towards the end of the show, this is just going to be a matter of fact conversation. And Eric has some timeline information that you can look into yourself. Yeah. Which we're going to put, we're going to put in the show notes and, and, and namely, which I'm going to read just a little bit of is Senator Ron Johnson posted a preliminary findings documents about 13 pages long. And it has some, uh, information paragraphs and also a timeline that's that's real informative, which which I'll hit on here in a second. So I'm going to put that in the show notes, and also 
shout out to our brother and mentor, one of our most important mentors, Mike Brown out there posted a podcast, um, the President's Daily Brief by Mike Baker. He had uh, James Gagliano on his show. It was phenomenal. I listened to it on my commute back to the training location I was at this last um, couple of weeks. And James Gagliano is a former West Point um, Ranger uh, infantry officer. And then he went into um, the FBI and he's a former supervisory special agent and former FBI HRT. He, he's been, he's been a part of a, a couple of these secret service details. So he kind of has an idea of, of what he's talking about. So I will also place that in the show notes as well, because he has some very, very good points and and hits on the failures, but also some interactions with some police officers. And and by the way, all the three police officers that I spoke with, I'm not going to name their names because the intent wasn't to talk about those conversations, but all three of these police officers also have been on Secret Service details. And so some of my thoughts on this, and I'm not going to go deeply into any of my speculations. I I don't think that's wise to do, but my initial thoughts on, on the failures were purely based on my military force protection experience. That's it. Nothing to do with, with close protection. And, you know, I've seen some comments um, from some people that we deeply respect basically saying, hey, if you haven't had any um, close protection detail, maybe it's not best that you comment on it. And I do agree with that to a certain point, but I also believe that there's enough information out there. And then circling back to any of us that have had experience with dealing with force protection downrange can, can at least intelligently think about it, you know. And I also, Aaron... So our audience knows our intent, or at least my intent, was to have some experts on the show to talk about it. But I sent out some, I sent out some text again to a few people that I deeply respect. And, you know, a a couple of them said, Hey, I I really don't, I I can't talk about it right now because number one, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm busy. Um, can't, don't have time right now. Um, but they also, one individual said, you know, I just don't think that's, it's good for me to comment on it right now. And the other gentleman just kindly said, Hey, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have time this week to talk about it. But one individual again, who I deeply respect basically texts me back kind of irritated that I even wanted to talk about it. So, Hmm. and and so I'll just leave it at that. Um, it was there was a little more discussion back and forth, but I'll just leave it at that. And that's why I brought up earlier. There seems to be a lot of contention around this. And to your point, Aaron, people have spoke about it agnosium. So maybe I get part of this person's thoughts on it. But but Aaron, I I can just, I'll just lay it out. I think he was upset with me that I even asked. But that's okay. You know, I respect his thoughts on it and. And we'll just leave it there. But I just brought all that up to say, hey, I was I wanted to have some experts on to talk about it, you know, but it, it just didn't work out with the individuals that I contacted. So. So the way that we're going to handle it is we're going to talk just briefly on the timelines and some kind of interesting aspects that I think came up. And let me get out these reading glasses again, <laughs> shuffling around so much stuff here. <laughs> and again, this is from Ron Johnson's, um, the, you know, of course, Senator Ron Johnson. This came from his website, which I posted online already. So let me get to this here, Aaron. So look at some of the timelines here. And all I'll say is in a couple of instances where I believe that you know, some of some of the failures just are, in my opinion, you know, preventable. 
you know, unexplainable and and why some some of these why something wasn't done or or why President Trump was even allowed to go out on stage and based on some of what's in in this these timelines. So preliminary timeline based on information uncovered by Senator Johnson's office. The following timeline includes information Senator Johnson's office has obtained during the week following the assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump on July 13, 2024. This preliminary information is being shared with the public to ensure transparency. July 5th, eight days before the Trump rally. According to local law enforcement, United States Secret Service first informs Butler County Emergency Services here, here forward will be Butler ESQ of the Trump rally scheduled for July 13th, 2024. Local law enforcement reportedly sees media reports of the rally around July 3rd. July 8th, five days before the Trump rally, Butler ESU reportedly meets with Secret Service regarding the rally and receives information regarding the timeline of the event and is informed that the rally will be held at the Butler Farm, excuse me, yeah, Butler Farm Showgrounds, July 10th, three days before. Secret Service reportedly conducts a site visit, so three days before. Secret Service conducts a site visit at the Butler Farm Showgrounds in advance of the July 13th rally. July 13th, day of the rally, 9 a.m., Butler ESU holds a briefing for the local SWAT and sniper units from Butler County, Beaver County, and Washington County providing security for the event. At the briefing, Butler ESU provides a 46-page slide deck with outlines, areas of responsibility for each local unit, and staging locations including sniper locations for each local unit and the Secret Service. According to the attendees of the briefing, no Secret Service or other federal law enforcement is present for this briefing. I say that's unexcusable right there. Somebody should have been there from the Secret Service and or the FBI. If they, I believe the FBI had some folks on the ground. I don't know that for certain, but I believe I've heard reports of that. But there were no federal law enforcement um, present during that briefing, which I, it's unacceptable in my eyes. According to attendees of the briefing, Secret Service had not initially intended to provide sniper units. They changed course for unclear reasons. Butler ESU's briefing includes an outline of the security perimeter for the event and areas of responsibility. 9.27 a.m. Thomas Matthew Crooks, the alleged shooter, enters a Home Depot located in Bethel Park, Pennsylvania. CCTV footage at the Home Depot reportedly shows the shooter entering alone. 941, Crooks purchases a 5.5 foot aluminum dual platform ladder. 942 a.m., Crooks exits the Home Depot. Yeah, I'll just skip that point right there. 9.30 a.m., excuse me, 10.30 a.m., two local law enforcement snipers are in position on the second floor inside the American Glass Research Building. 5.10 p.m., Crooks is first observed by one of the snipers. 5.10, this is, that's an hour before. Now, he may have not been um, observed as suspicious at that point, but the point is, is that he's been observed at, at this point. Um, roughly um, an hour before. 5.14 p.m., AGR Sniper 1 takes the below pictures of Crooks. 5.28 p.m., AGR Sniper 1 takes the below picture of a bicycle in what appears to be two bags located near the AGR building. And Aaron, I'll just point out there, you see mysterious, um, something that doesn't belong, especially bags, that should alert. Uh, authorities for obvious reasons could be a bomb of it something unattended around an event like that 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 alone i think was uh, also a big failure it's unclear what happened to the bicycle and bags after july 13th 532 p.m agr sniper one spots crooks looking at his phone and using a rangefinder. 
5.38 p.m., AGR Sniper 1 sends a message to the quote-unquote sniper group about crooks. And to my understanding, that's a signal text group reading from another report. So 5.40 p.m., AGR Sniper 1 is told to call into command regarding crooks. 5.41, AGR Sniper 1 calls into, into command and provides a description of crooks and the rangefinder, as well as that Crooks is lurking around the AGR building. Okay, so let's lay that out right there. What's that time frame? That's 30 minutes. So 30 minutes, he's reported to the command, the talk, that that this is this individual is lurking around, you know, has a rangefinder, so on and so forth. So 30 minutes before they're aware that this um, individual is lurking around, Seemingly, un, excuse me, seemingly suspicious. 5.49 p.m., photos of crooks are sent to the Butler ESU command. Okay, so now the photos have been forwarded. Butler ESU at 5.55 p.m. Command, excuse me, confirms a receipt of the photos and states they have been relayed on. I don't know what that means. Was it relayed to the Secret Service? Secret Service? I don't know. But all during this time, my thoughts are they don't they don't allow um, Trump to go out on stage at this point, right? Just my thoughts on it. <clears throat> Six oh five. Let's see. Hold on a second. Um, oh, five fifty nine p.m. Butler ESU command asked for the direction that Crooks is traveling. AGR sniper one is initially unsure of the direction Crooks is traveling. Six oh five p.m. AGR Sniper 1 later communicates that Crooks is seen moving northeast in the direction of Sheets and that Crooks has a backpack. 6.06 to 6.12 p.m. AGR Sniper 1 goes to ground floor of the building to meet local law enforcement patrol to alert them to Crooks' presence. Approximately 6.11 p.m., Crooks began shooting. So during that time, the, the sniper had went to the ground floor to meet with local law enforcement to alert them. So that, that in and of it, so they're really actually starting to try to take action at that point, right? So at that point, it was a, a small duration of a handful of minutes. But again, I ask why? If it was known um, Crooks was being suspicious a good 30 minutes before, why something wasn't done beforehand? It, hey, go ahead, so, Aaron. So this, uh, are you done with that timeline? No, no, no I'm not, Aaron. Okay. But go ahead. I can, I can carry on. and it, It's, it's all, I'm almost done, Aaron. I'm just okay. a few more pages. And then, and then I'm just going to lay out what I think is the biggest failure of all, which, again, based on just basic force protection. But back to the timeline. So, again, 6.11 p.m., Crooks begins shooting. Secret Service reportedly return fire and Crooks is killed. 6.23, Beaver County SWAT operators access a roof where Crooks is located and confirms Crooks is deceased. According to two, those SWAT operators, there was local law enforcement from another county and at least one Secret Service agent wearing a suit also on the roof. Crooks is patted down. This is at 6.46 p.m. Law enforcement reportedly finds a, a transmitter device, Crooks' phone and the rangefinder. Now, to my knowledge also, Aaron, I don't think it, it may be up in the more detailed section here, which we weren't going to read because of time is that they found two devices in his in his van. So this is quite interesting as well, Aaron. So 7.45 p.m. to 7.46 p.m. at, at the request of the Allegheny Bomb Squad, I'm, I hope I said that right, local law enforcement texts pictures of crooks and the items near his body to a phone number with a 215 area code from the Philadelphia area associated with an ATF agent. ATF reportedly is using the pictures of crooks to run facial recognition, which Aaron, I, I, Whoa. I, I wonder what, what is the ATF being involved in facial recognition? 
I don't know. That doesn't sound. It just sounded odd to me. I'm just going to say say that out loud. Yeah, um, it's strange. Yeah. So, so Aaron, to that that's the the baseline. Um, I can go a little further into to the timeline, or that's actually the end of. There's there's just some questions at the end. Again, there's much more detail in this in this preliminary findings, which I'm going to post in the show notes so folks can read it for themselves. But Aaron, back to the most basic failure that, that, you know, in my opinion was the biggest problem. And that is the fact that that 130 yards away from the podium, that that building was not secured. You know, either was somebody posted on top of it, which to my knowledge that there was claims that it was too hot up there. So originally some cops were up there and they got down because it was too hot, which I don't know all the details around that. But one of the questions I had is then, well, if it was too hot, why was Crooks able to low crawl on his belly in a T-shirt? But, you know, on, on top of that building. So I don't know what that meant. Maybe these. Maybe these police officers, they were getting overheated or something. I don't know. Um, but I, I find that odd. So, but somebody should have been posted on top of that building. They should have cleared the building before um, President Trump went on because of the knowledge of that line of sight. Heck, you had counter sniper unit that had a line of sight of that building because they clearly identified it as a threat, right? And I have heard reports that they had looked at those buildings around it and that that they they saw that as a possibility i asked the question why not and this is again coming from you know force protection basics is having some form of man made defilade between that line of sight point and and the and the actual podium it could be something as simple as a as a as a, a large um, banner which I know they've used in the past for that exact function, bro. Can, and, can yeah, you can you um, explain what that means to us that don't know exactly what defilade means? So, and, and, so defilade is is just basically that you cannot see to a point, meaning that that if I have defilade as let's say I'm leading a a squad of infantry soldiers. And what defilade is to me is that I have some form of visual cover. It, I mean, it could be as simple as a bunch of trees or mm-hmm. a, a ledge or a berm, mm-hmm. you know, or a, you know, say, for instance, T-walls downrange. I don't know, they, they're not going to bring in T-walls. That's not what I'm saying. But that's something that we use downrange, too, is, is T-walls is, you know, of course, it's actual cover. But it mm-hmm. also has the benefit of being, of being defilade or man made defilade, stacking connex up high enough. Like you got a high point way far out, you know, like in some mountains, but you got a lot of personnel in a in in an enclosed area, and say like a fob or a cop. You know, you put stuff up high um, if you're wanting to keep those positions from being observed. Now, granted, you also have to look outwardly. You know, you gotta you gotta have folks that are monitoring those high that high ground that you may not own. But to that point, is that building at that point was high ground that needed to be owned by law enforcement and the Secret Service? Plain, plain and simple. And now I did not know this. I, I probably should have done a Google Maps just to look at the area a little more thorough myself when I did my initial thought or I had my initial thoughts on it, but also you had that water tower, that former seal sniper pointed that out. It's like, man, why was there not somebody in overwatch up at that water tower? You know, and again, I didn't mean to go in to start all these questions, but my point is, is that building should have been secured plain and simple. Another question I had is why wasn't there um, drone coverage? You know, speaking of drones tonight and, that was also something that James um, Gagliano brought up as, I mean, hey, why not at least have a drone? Well, t- what I've been finding out, and you may have seen this, Aaron, is that local law enforcement had requested the use of a drone and was denied that mm-hmm. by the Secret Service multiple times. 
Yeah, I I why, why did read they an deny article. that? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just saying that I read an article that said that for some reason the Secret Service, as far as I understood it, that the local law enforcement offered it, offered to um, provide the drone coverage, and that the Secret Service said, "No, we don't need it." Yeah. Um, is is that what you're talking about? Yeah, Am, yeah, I, did I see that right? Yes, absolutely. Now, and and one thing's for sure, we get all these details right, and often crap's wrong. You know. Um. So, did that really happen? I don't know. It seems it, it seems plausible for sure. It, yeah, and again, these this is all preliminary findings from uh, Senator Johnson's office. But a well, lot of this seems to be playing out, you mm -hmm. know, as on the ground um, data, at least data points. And again, we, ha we have to really drive home the fact that there's still an investigation going on. Mm -hmm. This is all preliminary. And of course, we could find, find out a lot different information coming out. But a lot of this seems to be some fairly solid, solid data points. Um, now I will say this, Aaron, you know, I am curious about how all the communications were set up and I'm not at all saying that secret service should have had the same exact frequency as a um, local. I'm not saying any of that. What I do find interesting is it also does sound like that Pennsylvania law enforcement were not allowed to be in the secret service talk. Hmm. And I don't, I don't understand that. The way that we would Seem, handle a situation like, like that, force protection wise, between different units and even international partners, is that you would have a liaison inside the operations center or the talk, so that you know, and they would be monitoring their radios, and at least they could make other units or other segments of support aware of something. So I don't mm -hmm. know. Again. I'm, I, that's about as far as I'm going to go with any form of, of wondering and speculation. I, I you know, I don't want to get too far down that, but I do find that to be also an interesting point. Yeah, no, oh, that'll be interesting to see now, but like, and this isn't conspiracy that I'm about to say is we'll probably never know the most well, important details um it, it stinks but th dude that's that's life in this world now well aaron I, i'm gonna say one little tidbit that could be concerned because you be considered political but aaron i'm sure you probably saw it why on earth would um fbi director ray go out in front of congress and create some doubt whether or not what hit Trump was a bullet or if it was, it was shrapnel. Why would he go out there and say that openly when there's still, you know, and there's other evidence that, you know, there was even a picture, but again, why go out there and say that when you're supposed to be trying to limit the questions around it? And bro, I think yeah, he, gave, he would, he wouldn't answer some questions, but then, put that out there which sounds ambiguous like it seemed to me like he was just creating doubt and giving aid and comfort to those folks all over the media that want to say oh trump wasn't shot that was it was staged yeah which is yes, which yes, is you know and i can't remember which news outlet it was but they ran with that information and talked about hey he, he may not have actually been shot with a bullet okay Let's just, it, there are, um, understanding even the basics of how, um, bullets and, you know, projectiles work. There is a, a handful of scenarios that certainly he could have been hit with bullet fragments. If, of course, if the, if the shooter shot really low and there was a hard enough surface for it to fragment and then, and then, um, further go and, and at an angle to hit him or you know of course if there's something really really hard like still right 
you could you if it was directly below him, right, still could deflect fragments up. I'm just that's just examples. I'm not saying that's what happened, but at the same time, the way that news article presented it and the way others have have ran with it is that it was less of a it was okay it was it less of an assassination attempt is that better for you being against trump that it wasn't quite as bad as what what everybody thought or what you so so was it a less uh, was it any less of an assassination attempt being shot at with an ar-15 yeah, I, I I find it, it's yeah, it's you know weird. I I find it just, I I I I'm just gonna say it this way. I can understand why you have so many people that are at, well. I I do know part of it, you know, because it's it's uh, derangement syndrome. But the very fact that there is a segment of the media that they are they just hate the fact that and and we're thinking, man, we wish this didn't happen and we're we're thinking about okay how, what could have prevented it but instead they're concerned more about hey how is this going to help i mean darn it this is going to help trump so we got to downgrade the severity of it or or you know put put into question what happened but what i will say then again another pretty good show um podcast on was uh rich brown and and uh, mike seeklander did a show on this a few days ago and you know they talked about up front you know what set what set the stage or what made this more likely to happen was a lot of the the rhetoric horrible rhetoric out there Mm -hmm. and you know i thought about this myself and mike seeklander said the same thing it's like man if if he would have been killed i i I don't know how this would have went down you know what what would happen to our country at that point? Would this have been the the um, pushing over the edge? I don't know, but I I do know this: if if he would have been killed, man, I, I I hate to think of what could have happened at that point. You know, well, bro, I I want to ask one question, and and I think it's a a good question to end the show on. Just as a, even as a lay person, I I don't understand why a hard perimeter would be stopped at, at or before that building. And it seems pretty, I mean, were there other buildings that weren't, besides the, um, you, you brought up the water tower. Were there other buildings or that were not that were not um taken care of, or was this the only one that was a problem that that somehow was was not covered and not secured so Aaron to my uh, absolutely there are more buildings around there and without okay. w- and without speaking out of line to my knowledge Aaron. The building in question was the building that had a line of sight to Trump himself. Okay. That the other buildings, to my knowledge, because of the stage, everything around it, you know, and other, you know, line line of sight locations um, couldn't see the president, to my knowledge. You know, from mm-hmm. what I see and looking at pictures on the ground, uh, again, that information could change when, when – the, the investigation possibly provides more details, but looking at film around around that location and looking at some some overhead satellite view of the location, that's what I perceive. Well, bro, yeah, so. it, it's still, okay, so let's say there's other buildings that should have been secured. Let, let's put that aside, but like you said, this was a line of sight. It just seems like it's ridiculous not to have people posted on top of that building, no matter if it's freaking hot or not, right. doing their dang job. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, There's no excuse for it. Uh, it. Again, look look at how the shooter was able to low crawl on his belly 
going to get up there in position to shoot. And he didn't look like the most robust type of person. You know, I'll just say that. Yeah. Looks like a skinny loner. You know, he low crawled up there, um, got into position to take those shots. And yeah, so again, the other failure or what I believe contributed to a lot of these failures was a lack of resources, man. You know, and I know that there are various levels of packages for secret service details, but you would think that, you know, Miss Chittle or Chettle, however her name is pronounced, because I, I understand that that the Trump campaign had asked for um, beefed up security and, and they were denied it. I don't know the full story on that, but what I would say is, is that uh, you would definitely have an easier way of securing those buildings if you had more personnel. Mm-hmm. You know, so, but the personnel that were on ground, if there were police officers that were inside that building and not on top of it or not making sure that nobody could get up that building, that that's an ultimate failure, yeah. you know? So, well, man, you know, hopefully we didn't break the internet and piss off too many people because we don't have specific expertise, but, um, we we really felt there was at least some discussion to be had. Bro, your your knowledge of of securing perimeters and being within them and and helping actually secure perimeters it and I even think further it, it just as a lay person it doesn't make much sense to me that some a building like that wouldn't be secured. So, like Forrest Gump said, that's. All I have to say about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to, a good way to end it. You know, all right, man. Well, listen, I think that, I mean, we, we went over what we decided or excuse me, had tried to speak in the perimeters, but we, we, uh, we went over that, but that's okay. Still have a, a good amount of time to go hang with the family and get ready for this upcoming work week. I'm glad to be back to my normal schedule. So, yeah, bro, well, I'm going to go. I, I smell some food cooking in there. Going to eat dinner with my family and me, my wife, and my two boys. We're going to head down to the neighborhood pool and and swim a bit in the summer sun. You know, sunset. It's going to start setting here in a little bit, but going to have a nice time with the family. That sounds great, man. Enjoy that. That sounds like a blast. All right, bro. Well, you take it easy. Love you. Love you too, man. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.